Christmas Church. We are the Sergu Salmesi family. Please join us in this morning's lighting of the third Advent candle. Please follow along in the bulletin for words we will say together at the end. We dream of God's dream, a world at peace, where people are not held in bondage, where children have all they need to learn and play in safety, where poverty is eradicated and justice is the standard. We dream God's dream of a world at peace, where all have enough to eat, a place to call home, and community care is our starting place. We remember God's promise of a ruler of peace is an invitation to us all. We can be filled with the spirit of God, of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of justice and faithfulness. Let us say together, we relight the candle of hope, love, joy, and today light the candle of peace. We pray, come Lord Jesus, open our lives to the peace which you bring. Let us turn to you and get ready. Good morning, beloved. Let us pray. God, through good weeks and bad weeks, through snowstorms and treacherous times, through pandemics, you remain faithful. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in worship today. God, we thank you that wherever we are, whatever type of week we may have had, you have allowed us to pause long enough to sing together, to pray, to hear a word from you. Holy Spirit, do thy will. Your people are listening. We pray this in the name of the one that we wait for, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn today, beloved, is Awake, Awake and greet the new morn.
Good morning, church. With confidence in God's mercy and grace, let us together confess our sins. God, who never leaves our side, thank you for your abiding presence. We admit waiting is hard to do. It can feel like too much, and we start to live as though we have never experienced a miracle. It gets too heavy, and so we keep the birth of your son confined to the Christmas season. We do not yearn for his coming each moment in our waiting hearts. Forgive us. Help us rejoice in the tr truth that your grace can eliminate difficult seasons. Amen. Now hear us as we confess in the silence of our hearts what is ours alone to confess. And let us together say amen. amen. I invite us to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. You may pray in whatever version or language you may know, or you may follow along in the bulletin if you have it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, journeying through life under the weight of shame or guilt imposed by others or ourselves can only lead to a life of distress. The good news of Advent is God offers us peace. God wants us to exchange our shame for forgiveness, our guilt for accountability and repair. So hear this good news. In the name of the one that we wait for, Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. It is with that good news, beloved, that I welcome you to virtual worship here at the Lafayette Avenue Presbyterian Church. We are a diverse community of faith where people of faith or no faith at all, we believe can come and experience the divine through openness and honesty, through music and laughter, through prayer, and of course, through worship. Beloved, we wanna say thank you and continue to say thank you in this season because you have trusted each other and the leadership of this church as we continue to believe that it is safer for us to do that worship together um, apart, tethered together by the Spirit of God. Beloved, we pray that as you continue to keep you, your communities, your network safe, that you also see your church family as an extension of all that. And while the doors of the church may be temporarily closed, beloved, we want you to know that the mission of this church continues. It continues in the fact that we want to stay connected to one another. That's why after worship, every single Sunday, God willing, half an hour after the service ends, you can join us in fellowship hour. On Wednesdays, beloved, at 6 o'clock, you can join us for prayer, and then at 7 for Bible study. 
The ways that you can join us in all of those virtual places are sent in the invitation to worship that goes out every single Saturday, thanks to our communications team. And beloved, do not fret if you're not yet on that list. Just reach out to the church office. We will be more than happy to place you on that list. Shoot us an email, give us a call, leave a voicemail. We'll make sure that you get on that list. A few things, beloved, in the form of announcements that I'd like to lift up at this moment. The first is an exciting invitation for another dose of virtual worship for all of us. Whether you are joining us on Facebook or YouTube or Zoom, we want to invite you this Thursday, Christmas Eve, at 7 p.m. to our Christmas Eve service, beloved. You do not want to miss it. It's going to be different this year as much of the year has been for us, beloved, but we are still excited for the opportunity to bring a Christmas Eve service and an opportunity for us to wrestle and celebrate with the birth of Jesus and what it means in the world. So we just invite you at 7 p.m. Eastern, wherever you may be in the country or the world, join us right back here, whatever platform you're on. On, we are going to be excited to bring you an incredible spirit-filled worship service. In addition to that, beloved, I'd like to lift up the exciting news that the nominating committee of this church has gotten underway and is doing its work. To those of us who may not know, the nominating committee in a Presbyterian church is a committee of elected officers, some who are already serving as session members or deacons, but also members at large that really help us to invite those of you who are members into places of leadership here at the church. The nominating committee is underway doing its work, beloved, but here's what we need from you. If you're a member of this church, beloved, we invite you to let us know if you would like to be considered to uh, be a candidate um, coming on to in a form of leadership, whether you want to be a session member, which means that you would be part of the group that is trusted by the congregation to steward the business of the church and bring our ministries forward. You can let us know whether you'd like to be a deacon collaborating with me to bring pastoral care to the congregation. You might even let us know whether you'd like to be part of the nominating committee um, itself, helping to bring on new leadership into the life of the church. Beloved, of course, this process looks vastly different this year. So we invite you, if you have a nomination of another person or if you want to nominate yourself, Beloved, we invite you to reach out to the church office, send an email to info at lapcbrooklyn.org, and in that way, beloved, we might be able to invite one another into the stewardship of the gift that is this church, LAPC. Finally, I'd like to invite everybody tuning in, every single friend of this church into a book discussion that will be launching at the end of January 2021. Some uh, members of this church have gotten together and we have an invitation for us to read together the book Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. You might know her work, The Warmth of Other Sons, but in this work, beloved, we will wrestle with the invitation for us to look at how a system of caste is at work here in these yet-to-be United States of America. With all that's going on in the world and in this nation, I promise you it is a book discussion that you will not want to miss. So do us a favor, reach out to the church office in the same way. Let us know if you're interested in joining that discussion. We'll make sure that we include you in the invitations that go out. We are excited 
put it on your calendar. End of January, we'll be reading the book cast. You can go ahead, grab the book, and we will join in that together. With that said, beloved, I invite us to pass the peace wherever we may be. If you are on Facebook or YouTube or Zoom, just let us know where you're tuning in from. It is always a joy for us to hear where we are coming in from that we might greet one another as we are kept together by God's Spirit. We are led into that moment by the ministry of music. God, giver of life and all gifts, open our hearts and ears to hear your word today. Grant us the gift of understanding, a curious spirit, and a receptive soul. May the sacred text challenge, encourage, and renew us today. Amen. Before Jane reads our text for today, beloved, I'd like to give us a little bit of context that will um, set the stage for what it is we will be wrestling with today. Beloved, we have officially made the jump into the New Testament, into our Gospels. And beloved, for the time being, all throughout the spring, we as a church community will wrestle with the words and lessons from the gospel according to Luke. And beloved, as we head into uh, the end of Advent, as we make our way towards Christmas Eve and the birth of Jesus, beloved, you don't get any more classic than the birth story of Jesus coming from Luke. If you've never heard about the arrival of Jesus through the lens of Luke, 
This gospel that is written by a physician hanging out with the disciples really is where you want to go. Beloved, Luke, I like to say, has all of the tea. Luke lets us know all of the background going into the birth of Jesus. And Luke wants us to know that you can't understand how Jesus comes into the world without understanding some of the drama that enfolds his birth. So as Jane reads, I invite you to see where our theme of the week in this time of Advent, peace, shows up in the life of Mary, a teenager who is about to receive the shock of her life. Our reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke. We will read from chapter 1, verses 26 through 56. The Greek is translated into English this way. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestors, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month of her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to Judea, town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and acclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed! You are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed 
that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generations to generations. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to be to God. Thank you, Jane. Beloved, for the time that is ours to share this morning, this final Sunday of Advent, I'd like to place a tag on this text from which I shall attempt to preach as the Spirit shall guide. I'd like to preach from this thought, peace when your life turns upside down. Peace, when your life turns upside down. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity for us to worship together, even virtually. God, we have prayed, we have sung, and now we need to hear a word from you. For if we don't hear a word from you, O oh God, what shall we do? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in thy sight, for you are our strength, and without a doubt, you are our redeemer. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Peace, when your life turns upside down. Beloved, I wonder what Mary is thinking that day. As she lays down to go to sleep or perhaps goes about her day, I wonder what flows through her mind. I wonder, does she dream of her life with Joseph? What their home will look like? Does she wonder about what a family they lead will function like? I wonder what Mary is thinking about this day. Does she think about how love under subjugation and empire is in itself a form of resistance? She is only a teenager, some scholars say about 14 years old. So I wonder if she's trying to hold on to her teenage years, thinking about her friends or loving and hating her family at the same time, thinking about the next time she'll be able to hang out with her friends and have a good time. I wonder what Mary is thinking this day. The day that an angel named Gabriel shows up and turns her life upside down. Beloved, you heard the text. Gabriel tells Mary that she's going to, by the Holy Spirit, become pregnant, have a child, 
and the child will be the son of God. Yeah, um, Gabriel's tidings may have been good news to Gabriel, but to Mary, beloved, I would posit that she's hearing the end of her life as she knows it. Beloved, she must have been thinking about her very life, her reputation, and her fiancé. Fourteen years old, y'all, she is scared. She's probably panicking and does not know what to do. But beloved, Elizabeth must have had the reputation in the family as the one to go to when things go left. There's always one in the family. Yes, there is. Because Mary shows up unsure of how she's going to make it in this season. And beloved, I'm on assignment this last Sunday of Advent to show how Mary's arrival at Elizabeth's door and what happens when she arrives testifies not just to a scared teenager, but a teenager who somehow chooses peace when her life turned upside down. May I please show you what I see in the text? Oh. Beloved, I can admit when I am confused by things. And I am confused by this story at first. I, I've read it dozens of times in my life. I've heard it read on the radio. I've seen adults in my life dress up in sheets on Christmas Eve and act it out. But I am confused how a scared teenager in crisis goes from full-out sprint to her auntie's house to all of a sudden calling herself blessed. That's what she does. She, she shows up at Elizabeth's door, frantic and distressed, and somewhere in between her hello and Elizabeth's words of comfort, Mary shifts to singing the praises of God, and she calls herself favored. She seems to me, at least, to be at some sort of peace. Now, um, that's perplexing, beloved, because her crisis is not over. The scandal that she's running away from at home is not gone. And yet she seems to be at some sort of peace. So here's the question I began to ask Luke. I said, Dr. Luke, how is it that Mary is able to have peace when her crisis is still going on. And here's what the doctor said. Doc said, Rev, did you notice that Mary sings a song? Tell me what you hear when she sings that song. So I made my way to the text, beloved, and I started to listen to Mary's song. And the more that I listened to the words, I began to hear it as Mary making a statement about who God is. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Mary begins to sing a song that needs to be put in context for most of us to understand it today. 
See, Mary grows up, beloved, in Nazareth. And because she makes her way to Elizabeth, we know that she has family in the Judean hill country. That may not mean much to some of us today, but what you need to know, beloved, is that Mary, because of where she lives and where her family is, grows up hearing about a legacy of rebellion against the empire and living amongst them. Y'all, Mary grows up subjugated under an empire and is raised in a community that is always resisting in the name of a God that is a God of revolution. So Mary grows up hearing about God who wants the hungry fed. Mary grows up hearing about God who wants wealth redistributed to those at the margins and those without so that they have what they need. She hears about a God who does not value the empire more than she does the people. She grows up hearing about God who is not on the side of the empire destroying lands and imposing violence through a police state, but she hears about God who's always going to choose to be on the side of the people, the working people, the organizing people, the people who are neglected and ignored and oppressed. So here's what I posit. Elizabeth's words of blessing must lead Mary to think about this God. And she thinks to herself, this God won't abandon me. That a God who is concerned with what's happening in the ghetto that a God who weeps when Black Lives Matter's banners are torn from churches, that a God who is vexed when pride banners are vandalized in front of churches, that God will not abandon me. Because who God is for Mary is enough to assure her that no matter the difficulty, God will be present. And beloved, that is the source of her peace. Can't you hear it from the text? That if we ever find ourselves struggling in a situation, as we round out this year of calamity with pandemics and rebellion and murders of black and brown people in the street after an election that 45 still won't accept with his followers mobilized to violence in the streets with many of us missing our family, we are reminded that God who has not forgotten the oppressed is a God who will be present with us. That ought to inspire some peace. But not only is peace possible, because the God that Mary knows who stands on the side of the oppressed will be present with her. Here's what Luke wants us to understand. Peace is possible for Mary because Mary learns during her stay at Elizabeth something about waiting. The text bears witness, beloved, to Mary learning that waiting is not an obstacle, but y'all, it's a place that we witness God move. It's right there at the end of our passage. Luke writes, and Mary remained with her 
about three months and then returned home. It matters that Mary remains at Elizabeth's house for three months because of what happens while she waits. For three months, beloved, she lives with Elizabeth, watching and talking and laughing and crying, and Elizabeth continues to speak life to her while she waits. For three months, Mary continues to hear the prophets and the revolutionaries of her community talk about bringing down the empire and will not let the Jews lose their identity. Revolution continues while she waits. Mary is learning and transforming and reflecting. Y'all, Mary no doubt changes while she waits. And after three months, John, her little cousin, a miracle baby, John is born while she waits. It matters that Mary stays with Elizabeth for three months because waiting is sometimes thought of being a standstill where nothing happens. And beloved, when waiting is confined to this definition, I don't blame any of us for not wanting to wait. Uh, of course, we all want to see it as an obstacle we can't wait to barrel our way through. But beloved, those three months teach Mary and us that waiting is not an obstacle. It's the very place that God moves. On the way to where we're going, beloved, we're reminded in this text that God is still moving. And beloved, five days before Christmas, that's all I came to drop in someone's spirit. Whatever it is you're waiting for in life, whatever the destination is, whatever the goal is, don't rush past the waiting because God still moves in the wait. Beloved, God will meet you with hope in the wait. God will keep showering, showering you with love in the wait. Joy will come your way in the wait. Miracles can still take place in the wait. Revolution is still possible in the wait. And I know that this year feels like a giant waiting period. Somebody just put in the comments right now, I can feel it in my spirit, we're tired of waiting. But in the midst of all the heartache and the grief and the sadness, beloved, I came to declare to someone's soul that God is still moving that justice is still being imagined, that lives are still being changed, that we are still being reminded that things will get better. When life turns upside down, hold on to your peace because God is still moving. Thanks be to God. It is with that truth, beloved, that I invite us into a moment of silence. Beloved, I still believe that even though some of us have had radically different change schedules, we still need time to just pause and listen to our bodies, to what the Spirit is saying. So take a moment that we might hear what the Spirit speaks to us now.
Beloved, as you're able, I invite you to take a deep breath in and breathe out. Take a deep breath in and breathe out. One more time, take a deep breath in and breathe out. Ashe and amen. Beloved, now I invite us into a time of collective giving in this place. Beloved, we understand that during this time of pandemic, this entire year has shifted many things for our households and for many of us, how we do things all together. We invite you in this moment only to give what you are able to. We continue to be thankful for the ways in which our church family has shown up in sustaining the mission and work of this church. Giving has never been easier here at LAPC. You're able to give in multiple ways. You can head to our Facebook page and there's a donate button right there. It's real easy to click on. Whatever uh, video you may be watching, whether it's YouTube or Facebook, there's a link in the description that allows you to donate there as well. You might head over to our website, click on the donate button in the upper right hand corner or link up with your banking institution for a regular donation or even sending a check in the mail. However you decide to give, beloved, even if your giving, beloved, looks in the form of continuing to serve in forms of leadership at the church, we invite you to look at this moment as a moment to show gratitude. We are led there by our ministry of music. Now, beloved, I invite you to lift your voices and your spirits 
as we sing our final hymn of the morning, I've Got Peace Like a River. Beloved, I want to thank all of you for tuning in this Sunday morning whenever you are taking in this service. We want to say thank you for continuing to share this church and its services with those in your networks, letting them know that this might just be a place where they hear words of encouragement and challenge as we go through this life together. Beloved, I want to say thank you to all of those who make uh, this service possible and those who made it possible today to the Somazi and Sergiu family who led us in our Advent lighting ritual. We say thank you. We appreciate you. Uh, to our liturgist today, the incredible, the incomparable Jane Adams, we say thank you for your presence and for being here. Uh, to our soloist Jessica Kimple, we thank you for your amazing voice to the genius behind the keys, beloved, J. David Williams, who continues to lead our music program so ably, and to those behind the scenes bringing the service to us, to Michael Craig, to Daniel Ortiz, to Clint Robinson, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. Now let us receive our benediction. May the God of Elizabeth and Mary the God that meets us in our waiting, be present with you too. May hope overflow in your life. May love be showered upon you. May joy burst at every seam, and may peace ground you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>